I'm David Bryant. I am the Campaigns and Engagement Manager for the California Native Plant Society, and we are so delighted that you're here to celebrate California Native Plant Week with us. Um, there is, you know, so much to be excited about. Um, it's Earth Day today. As I mentioned, it's California Native Plant Week. And in fact, the Congress has declared April Native Plant Month. So this is the best week of the year, best month of the year. And we're so excited that you're joining us to uh, learn about all the ways that you can grow care for California native plants. And what is really exciting is we have a, a really great panel of guests tonight that really illustrate all the different ways that you can connect with, enjoy, appreciate, act for native plants. So I want to pass it over to my fabulous colleague, Lee O'Keefe, who's our Senior Director of Public Affairs at CNPS, to introduce a little bit more about the week and the campaign that we have going on. Thanks, David, and happy Native Plant Week, everyone. Um, well, for those of you that don't know about CNPS, I'll just quickly let you know that the California Native Plant Society, or what we refer to as CNPS, um, is a 501c non 501c3 nonprofit, and our mission is to protect California's native plants and habitats. Um, and also to cultivate joy and, and education and love for native plants um, across California. And today, you know, our theme of this year's Native Plant Week is Grow Care Everywhere. And, um, you know, CARE is our acronym for Cultivate, Act, Restore, and Enjoy. And today we're going to talk to a really fun range of guests to talk about how they grow care everywhere. And it's in all kinds of different ways. So I think, David, that we should get this party started and kick things right off. Fabulous. All right. So our first guest is Hannah Kang, and she is a professional botanist. She studied plant biology at UC Davis. Um, she is a, an aficionado um, of herbaria, herbariums, which are living, or uh, not living, collections of plant material that researchers and scientists use um, in their study. Um, and so welcome, Hannah. We're so excited to have you uh, to talk to us about how you grow care. Hi, David. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So, All right. So Hannah, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to love native plants. Well, I was totally plant blind before college. <laughs> I had no idea what a native plant was. I really didn't even know there was a difference. And so I was originally pre-med. I really, it was my dream to be a doctor, but that changed when I took my first botany course mm. and I learned about native plants and it just fascinated me so much, especially since my professor talked to us about indigenous people's uses with native plants that really intrigued me. And honestly, native plants are just so amazing. I learned something from them every single time I'm out. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. Awesome. Can, can you tell us a little bit more? Because I think that's such a great term to explore and, and to have people understand. Can you talk to plant blindness a little bit and yeah. what the implications yeah. of that are? So, well, how I perceive plant blindness is when, you know, you don't really understand how plants impact your life. You don't understand that your clothes are made out of plants. You don't understand fossil fuels and gas, and you don't understand that, you know, all these the fruits and vegetables you see at the grocery store are actually really weird hybrids from naturally occurring phenotypes. And so plant blindness is everywhere. There's no shame in it. You know, I was plant blind for like 20 years, <laughs> but it's important to acknowledge how important plants are and the vital role they play in our everyday life. Thank you. That's beautiful. I love that. Well, Hannah. I, I I think about that a lot too, you know, just that it, for another way I think about plant blindness is people looking and just seeing green, right? It's, it's just green as opposed to seeing that there might be hundreds and hundreds of species just within what they're looking at right there. Absolutely yeah. love. All right. Well, so everyone on the panel today comes at uh, native plants in a really different way. You are a professional botanist. And what does a day look like for you? 
So it depends. Like there's, you know, my field days, there's my research days, and then there's my office days. Mm -hmm. So here I was doing research that's, uh, I was getting, trying to get DNA from Sedalcia kekii with a PhD student at UC Davis. And so what I mainly do at work is that I conduct a lot of floristic surveys and I also prepare a lot of technical documents for whoever it is, whether it's a certain agency and that, you know, my work really ranges a lot. I could be out in the field, you know, hiking like 10 miles, trying to find rare plants or, you know, working on a permit or I could just be in the office keying out plants, looking at very specific details in keys to differentiate what rare mm -hmm. plant a rare species looks like versus like a really common lookalike. So uh, it really depends, but I was really afraid <laughs> to become a botanist because I knew that I love plants and I never wanted plants to feel like work for me. And so I was really afraid of that. But, you know, my professor always said, like, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And she's right. <laughs> That's awesome. So Hannah, um, we know you love herbaria. Can you tell us what an herbaria is and what excites you most about the world of herbaria? I do love herbaria. Thank you for bringing that up. Wow, that's such a loaded question. But <laughs> <laughs> that's Ellen Dean, Dr. Ellen Dean, and she was the curator at the UC Davis Center for Plant Diversity. She also works for CNPS now as a rare plant botanist. And I just really believe that herbaria kind of wraps everything plant related together because when you have a herbarium specimen, that is a piece of natural history on a specimen sheet. And whether it doesn't have to necessarily be plant taxonomy related because it also relates to plant pathology, genetics, so many different fields, you know, like for instance, at UC Davis, we have a really wide collection of invasive plants because previous botanists like, you know, Beecher Crampton and other really great botanists were really interested in grasses, but we have so many non-native grasses in California, so many, and that's very significant agriculturally. And we have a record of that in the herbarium. And so a herbarium truly is a library of plants there's so much knowledge and history in our herbarium. And it's really a shame because that knowledge is getting lost. And a lot of plant science, plant biology related uh, majors and courses don't always highlight how important herbaria mm -hmm. really is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's so amazing. Um, what has your journey been like up to this point uh, as a professional botanist um, for those out there that might be interested in pursuing this field or maybe haven't even realized that this is uh, a, a possibility uh, to, to make their love of plants into a profession, um, what pathways, advice, or resources might you point out to others? So I really, if there is, if there's anyone in college, I really think that gaining connections within, you know, your circle, like whether that's your peers or your professors, or you know, someone from an internship, it's really important to gain those connections because they could offer your job later on, or they could, you know, forward you a graduate school program that will totally change your life. You know, you think that you might have like a really straight trajectory as a botanist, like I just want to do plant ecology. I want to study how um, sh fire is shaping our chaparral communities or something. But if you just expand your horizon and get to know everyone, not just people that, you know, your like professors that teach something that you're interested in, that's really important because I can't tell you how many like emails and great conversations and really, really important emails I've received 
from my connections in college. So if you're in college, try to like network and, you know, really learn like, what can I do to really expand my horizon and, you know, branch out. Beautiful, thank you so much. Such great advice, Hannah. I, I think that's just a lot of wisdom there. Well, thank you, Hannah. It's been wonderful that's chatting great, with Hannah. you. And um, <laughs> now, <laughs> now we're gonna introduce our next guest, Chelsea and Gabriel de Cuba of Sibling Rivalry Creative. Chelsea and Gabriel are the filmmakers behind a new documentary called Plant Heist, which is about deadly poaching here in California. And the film recently had its international debut at the South by Southwest Festival. So welcome, you guys. So glad you're here. Hi, uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, to thanks here. so much for doing Beautiful. Well, um, I hope everyone watching this has either watched Plant Heist or will watch it. It's currently available for free at MailChimp's Support the Shorts, and we'll provide a link in the chat before we sign off tonight. Um, but it's an amazing documentary. Gabrielle and, uh, Gabrielle and Chelsea, you did such a beautiful job. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and what inspired you both to create this movie, Plant Heist? Uh, yeah, um, we both work in filmmaking and me personally, I've, al I've always been uh, really into plants, uh, probably because my father was. Um, I'm originally from Florida, but moved out to California about five years ago, and there's a whole new, <laughs> a whole new world of plants, and uh, I just, I still can't get enough of it. Um, and actually, I saw these guys about four years ago when I was on an Airbnb, uh, and I saw them on the cliff, and I was so surprised. I was like, wow, there's these beautiful succulents growing all over the cliffs, and they're huge, and they're big and red, and I was fascinated by it and then fast forward a few years and you know I read I read a news article about the poachings and uh, that that kind of just kicked that kicked everything off because we were we were itching to make a story and and this was one that was basically in our backyard was wasn't too far from the Bay Area happening uh, in Mendocino and in uh, the surrounding areas so yeah we were really excited to tell this story from day one we we're like we gotta start like today at, after reading about it like this is this is perfect. <laughs> yeah. And, and Gabriel's always also got me into plants and into even have like having house plants and plants outside and all that kind of thing. So, you know, it, it was perfect for both of us. Um, and to get to work on this project has been great. You guys Beautiful. did a fantastic job with it. And I would just love to hear <laughs> any perspectives you have on, you know, what did you learn about Dudleya or even about our human connections to native plants and working on the film? Uh, yeah, definitely. We learned so much about Dudley. Yeah. Um, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen McCabe is an amazing person and just a wealth of knowledge. I think probably the world's top expert on Dudley specifically. Uh, so speaking with him just opened up the world. We did preliminary research online, but he really opened it up um, my eyes and Chelsea's eyes to just how many different types of Dudley are, how unique and special they are, how um, they're just so hardy and and uh, they're beautiful and they each have their own little microclimate that they need specifically um, to survive. And uh, yeah, they're, they're just really interesting plants yeah. for sure. And how specific they are to this area and, you know, and also Baja California as well is where it all first kind of started. And he like took us down that whole history of how that started and then how the poaching kind of started here due to those ones being so hard to access and the ones here being a lot easier to get to. Yeah, just those Dudleya that we didn't even, I think it was, I think it was Dudleya pachyphytum actually. Yeah, the Dudleya pachyphytum. That are found on remote islands. Um, and just opening up our minds to the science of this and, and how all, all this is all connected uh, was very fascinating for us. Wow, I love awesome. how you came, came at it just from like a very organic experience. Like you encountered these Dudleya on your own exploring in, in Northern yeah. California and the story now as you made this documentary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and now they're like, they're so special to us every time we see them. If we're on a hike together or something like that, we're just like, there's the death. Yeah, we totally nerd out on, <laughs> on the side and like whether it's flowering yeah. and 30 years old, like we're, we're in it, man, we're in it for yeah, sure. Yeah, you're, you're one of us now for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah we're, we're in it. <laughs> the audiences that, that might not know, like can, you know, through your language as filmmakers, can you kind of describe Dudleya, you know, where they occur? Because it is such a special, 
like you said, microhabitat that they that they occur right. in a unique place. So can you maybe yeah. paint the well, picture for us about the, the ones that we specifically focused in on on the film were they're called Dudley Afarinosa, and these are the ones that were sought after by poachers because of basically the way they looked. Um, and those ones grow on near the coast, and it's it's important for them to grow near the coast. They that's the microclimate they enjoy, and oftentimes what's really cool about them is they'll grow right in the cracks of rocks where you think like, how is this plant even getting soil or how is it taking its roots that long? You know, how is it surviving in the crack of that? That just looks like a rock and you have this giant Dudleya facing the water, flowering towards the water. Um, so they like, they like to be near the coast, the Farinosa specifically. And that's, that's where you'll see them and you'll see them all over uh, California's coast, um, specifically Farinosa. And then the other ones, you know, that's more of a McCabe question. From what I understand, there's there's a lot of micro <laughs> for, for, yes, there McCabe is, and, yeah. and Pachyphytum <laughs> and, and Cymosa pumila. And they, they all have their own little special habitats that they enjoy. Yeah. Well, I'd love to ask you, and you've spoken a little bit about this, but, you know, what, it's, what is it like to turn your filmmaker's lens towards plants? And I think it was clear in the documentary from, you know, there's a clip of a newscaster saying, like, of all things, people are poaching plants. Mm -hmm. It's like... <laughs> You know, and Hannah, Hannah mentioned plant blindness. It's like plants don't necessarily steal the spotlight, even though they should, and we're changing that. But what was it like as filmmakers to uh, embark on this documentary featuring um, plants? What was that like? Yeah, I think that was like early on in the discussion for us. It's like, how do we make plants like a character in this film? Yeah. And really like, so we think about wildlife all the time of, of poaching wildlife and we think of tigers and rhino horn, but plants get missed. And that, that's something that we both learned, you know, during this whole process is like the scale that this is happening in the world. And we wanted to take this local story and really try and give it like a global presence and, and bring it back in the end to like, this is happening everywhere. Um, and if we don't act, this is gonna affect everything else. So really just trying to make the plant a character in that way and like, tie emotion to that in, in any way that we could. And it happened to be a crime story. Yeah. It was the way that we kind of were able to do that and then bring this new new thing to life about protecting native plants. Yeah. yeah. You guys did it so effectively. And I'm I'm really curious, and this is this is our next question if for whoever's advancing the slides, but you know, I'm curious about um, when you guys have conversations with people who aren't in the plant world, and I'm sure that's all the time, you know, other other artists or friends in your community or whoever it might be, and they're like, What? What are you doing? What is that mm -hmm. on? Like, yeah. how do you guys like how is it that you describe to them why this issue matters? Well, I think it's yeah. You, you explain it to them, like Chelsea said, like there's, there's issues that are kind of automatic in people's minds where it matters. And that's usually with like wildlife, you know, like we see like tigers and, and rhino horn and elephants or you name it, some kind of animal that's sought after for its rarity. Um, and that's automatic, like, oh yes, we need to protect that. But you really need to apply the same type of thinking to native plants because, you know, once they're gone, they could be gone. And, and there, there are people around the world that are, you know, collecting these seeds and, and seed banks, but still it's such a, a rough road to start to get those numbers back up. So once they're gone like that, getting those numbers back is incredibly hard. And then you have the domino effect of how it, you know, affects that ecosystem where it's at. And, and I think in the film, you see McCabe go into that a bit and how it can affect hummingbirds and, and hawks and mice. And it's just, the list can keep going on. Um, and that's super important to understand. And so we want just those people that are interested in these plants and, and maybe they get interested in something that's, that's rare. You just, you really got to know where your source is coming from. Uh, kind of the same idea where, you know, these, these days it's really important to know where your coffee beans come from, you know, fair trade, it's, it's important. And if you're gonna buy plants, that's super important to know as well um, and to know what you're getting. And, and usually you're okay. Um, but once you get into some of these other types of plants and these uh, these rare looking plants, and, and if they come from the wild, whenever they come from the wild, it's wrong. And that's what we want people to understand. You, you just, you cannot take a plant out of the wild and then resell it. It's just never going to work that way. That's Thanks. awesome. Thank you for, for saying that so well. 
Um, there, there are some great characters in your film. <laughs> and also some, you know, I, I just imagine attaining some of the, the, the footage was kind of a feat, whether you're on those steep cliffs or crags or you're following, you know, various people through their, through their day. But, you know, can you maybe share some highlights or memorable moments from film production? Definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, <laughs> yeah. There's some uh, yeah it was, it was just me and Gabriel, you know, on production. Yeah. So, you know, like we were doing all the things uh, and trying to make everything work. Um, but I think for us, what really got us excited, especially in the beginning was that first interview with Pat, Patrick Freeling. And, you know, that took a, a little while to convince California Department of Fish and Wildlife to, you know, like to do this thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, first they were a little bit hesitant, yeah. you know, because they didn't know us and, and what we were going to do. And then after some conversations, um, we got the green light to interview Pat. And when we went up to Mendocino and interviewed Pat and afterwards, we were just like, wow, like he's fantastic. Like he's so passionate about his job and it, it just like and it shows uh, we hope it shows on on camera yeah um how much he cares for these plants and um yeah and I think that was like big huge for us in continuing on to make this documentary and like continuing on that path when we first interviewed Pat um on <laughs> it's it's hard to tell in the film but we are literally on the side of a cliff and Pat is a pro and uh <laughs> so, yeah. he we meet him at a mile marker and um I'm getting all my gear set up and it's quite a, you know, it's kind of a heavy camera and I have a whole a whole rig. And he's just like, he's taking us through the woods to get to this cliff. And I'm like, I'm attempting to follow him. And I'm like, okay, I got a lot here. I got to watch out for also Dudley. I don't want to step on any. And he's, he's trying to point them out, like stay away from yeah, there. And he's he like, goes, watch out for the Dudley. I don't goes, step on the Dudley. Yeah. <laughs> right, he, goes, <laughs> he goes right to the edge of the cliff. Like it was nothing. And he's like, is right here. And I'm like, that's, that's good. And I have to gingerly get there with my big camera rig and like, make sure my footing's okay. Because like on the, yeah. the side of the cliff, you can't really tell. And the shot that I got was a medium shot, mm -hmm. but right after that, it's just kind of nothing. And he's just so like yeah, yeah this is this is easy this is what I do every day I you know I roam these hills and, and you know look for poachers and whether it's abalone or, or Dudley yeah. um that's what he's used to so that was that was day one of meeting Pat and I didn't want to seem like I wasn't game for whatever so I was like we're doing it wherever you want to go we're going and we need to get this so. yeah there were parts where I was like stepping on Gabriel's foot while he was like with the camera like and I was like stepping on his foot to make sure make sure I didn't yeah. go too far Unbalanced. yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was so amazing. He just threw out some word for that camouflage, that full camouflage. For the ghillie suit. Ghillie. Everybody like, loves ghillie the ghillie suit. suit. Yeah. Every time that comes on, everybody's like, whoa, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, full camo. Yeah. He'll, he'll, he, if you're poaching, he's going to catch you. He's going to creep up and get you. Yeah. This man is passionate and he, he, he genuinely loves what he do. There's so much what passion for what he does. And I think if anything, if that inspires some audience members to get into this and like, that's what I want to do, then they need the help for sure. They have some pretty low numbers and, and hopefully that's another bonus out of this to, to maybe, you know, inspire some people to get into that field too. Yeah, that's awesome. I just, I just love so much when artists get involved in this sort of work. It just adds so, so much richness to the stories we're trying to tell. And you guys did such a fantastic job with this. I think it, you know, even while you were making it, it inspired a lot of people. And, you know, now we have assembly member Chris Ward of San Diego, you know, carrying um, a bill right now that's working its way through California state legislature to create, you know, real penalties on deadly poaching. And this would be, this would be the first bill specific to plant protection. So um, it is, it's a big yeah. deal and you guys are a part of making that happen. So thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for saying that. That's yeah, that's great. That makes us feel really, really good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both so much. We really appreciate it. All right. We're going to hop over to our next guest, Kathy Capone. She is a CNPS garden ambassador. And these are folks, uh, volunteers in communities throughout California who share and showcase their native garden and get people inspired and excited to include California native plants in their yard or their landscapes. So uh, she also is the native plant demonstration project manager for the Thule River Parkway uh, in Porterville or near Porterville where she lives. Um, and so welcome, Kathy. We're so excited to have you on our show tonight. Hi. 
Hi, hi, hi. Hi, Kathy. So happy to have you here. Well, okay. Take a step back and tell us a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to start growing native plants in the first place and then move on to this whole parkway project. Um, I am a retired special education teacher who is working for two different school districts right now, part time. Uh, but in addition to that, um, I, I um, have always been a gardener. I became a gardener around the time I entered kindergarten where I was uh, rooting geranium uh, cuttings in the windowsill, but it, it progressed from there. I have been, my interest in native plants, I think also started very young. My family lived in San Francisco, but we vacationed, um, our family had a vacation home at the Russian River. And underneath those redwood trees with the, um, with the ferns and the whole environment there with the bay trees, it really gave me an a, a different feeling to go to the Russian River and be under those redwood trees than when I was living in San Francisco on the sand dunes of the, of the Sunset District. So I really had a feel for plants very young. Um, my interest in native plants in the advocacy area um, came when I moved to Porterville in 1990 and I joined the group um, called the Tule River Parkway Association soon after that. Um, and that is a, a nonprofit, small environmental nonprofit group, which I'm now the president of, uh, advocates for the public access and public use and restoration and native plants along the Tule River. Um, one of the pro problems we had in restoration and development of a parkway in that river corridor is that there were not locally specific native plants available to purchase to do the restoration work. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've always had maybe more confidence than I should. And <laughs> I became, I, I began propagating native plants. And as that kind of evolved, I, um, I decided to have a native plant nursery, propagation nursery in my backyard. I have an acre and a half in town on very, very good soil. And I started that business while I was working full time and had two young children. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it got to the point where I could grow the plants, but I didn't have the time to also be selling the plants. So eventually I closed the nursery because it was, it, it, it became a loss, but um, I continued growing the plants for restoration purposes. Beautiful. Um, well, I want to ask you, you know, as you've gotten involved in, in restoration, in, a, in the Thule River Parkway, you know, what has changed for you um, in your garden uh, as you've transformed the landscape with native plants? So the, the property that we bought in Porterville is an acre and a half, like I was saying, and about half of it was a horse pasture. And it had only mostly annual invasive non-native grasses in the horse pasture with um, one dying, walnut tree. So I had a blank slate. It was a wonderful opportunity. Um, and I planted a few non-native trees, but um, I had the opportunity to really design a garden from scratch in very good sandy river bottom soil. Um, and so what it changed for me is that I could develop a landscape that mirrored the in it to some extent mirrored the environment that would have been there naturally. Um, and I used a lot of the foothill plants in my landscape. So Porterville is only 10 miles or so from the start of the foothills. So we're very close to the edge of where the, the elevation changes into a foothill kind of um, uh, community. And what I found was as I grew those native plants, the bird population increased markedly, even though wow. the, 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 the property as a whole had mature trees, that property had been a home since about 1948. So there were mature trees there in part of the property. But as the native plants came in, more, uh, more birds came in occasionally, even in uh, urban environment, we had quail, we have a lot of, um, native insects, we have ladybugs, we have other 
things that wouldn't be there without the native plants. And what we found is that as the landscape grew with native plants, people would comment, I feel like I'm in the foothills. <laughs> it, because not only the plants were there, but the plants provided the environment and the, and the scents. So mm -hmm. not our visual um, se uh, sense is one of the things that we use to understand an environment but also our, uh, how an area smells is a big cue to us to how we enjoy and how we identify a location. That's so insightful, Kathy. I think that's, that's really true. It speaks to just that, that need for that connection with nature that we, we all have. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear how your work in restoration on the parkway has influenced the way you see and approach gardening with native plants now? Um, I look at my garden more carefully now because I'm advising people on how to design and maintain gardens in a public space. So these gardens really need to be very low maintenance. And that's another thing that I've learned in growing native plants is my garden can take care of itself on its own much more than a garden would if they were horticultural plants that you buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. So these plants that I have in my garden would, uh, would occur there naturally or close to there naturally without any human intervention. So that as so that it gives you the um, information that they would need a lot less human intervention if you have them in your garden. So the picture that you see here is a young woman who recently graduated from high school. She graduated from high school um, in June of last year. And she uh, is, has adopted one of the gardens. She and her group, her group's name is Alianza Ecologista. Um, has adopted one of the gardens. And here she is, um, she's created this raised bed garden with uh, one of her friends and they created it out of concrete chunks that we brought into the garden area. Um, and then they just filled this raised bed with uh, dirt from the surrounding area. And this is a very sandy soil because it's river, river corridor soil. Um, so I think that Looking at the native plants in my garden has helped me to advise these groups who have adopted gardens. So currently we have 17 gardens that have been partially, fully or partially planted along the parkway. So it is really important that we develop low maintenance gardens and native plants are the way we can do that. Awesome. Um, you know, I think this is just worth asking for, for people out there that might just want to get started or have reservations and, and need to hear from someone inspirational like you. <laughs> what would you <laughs> recommend to someone just starting out with native plants in their garden? Um, I've thought about that question a lot, and I'm so glad that you posed it to me yesterday so I could think about it. <laughs> um, I think you have multiple aspects, and one of them is think about what you want the end product to be. If, if you have a vision, if you have an area that you'd like to model your garden after, think about what, what in nature interests you, what in nature speaks to you and how you'd like your garden to look in the future. I think that's one aspect. Looking at where you live, and what plants live in that local area or areas very much like your area will really help you. If you try to put in plants that can easily grow where you live, you're gonna have a much easier garden to take care of. If you try to grow, I live in Porterville, which is in the Central Valley in the Southern Central Valley. And our climate is not conducive to coastal redwoods. So, mm -hmm. People grow coastal redwoods, it's a very popular tree, but they need a lot of water and they tend to die off um, because it's the, there's not the humidity that coastal redwoods like. 
So pick plants that like your area, I think is a very important consideration. The other thing I wanted to say is look at your soils, look at what your garden is made of and pick plants which um, thrive in the type of soil that you have in your garden. Beautiful, thank you so much, Kathy. We really appreciate you talking about your experience as a gardener, as someone who has done restoration work in your local community. Thanks so much for sharing your perspective. It's great awesome. advice. And I want thank to close you, out this, 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 this discussion with Kathy, a plug for Calscape to Kathy's point about local native plants use calscape.org, which you can enter your address or, or your zip code, and it will provide you with a list of local native plants that are adapted to your specific area. And in fact, we've released a garden planner on Calscape. It's uh, prominent on that homepage of calscape.org that walks you through the process um, in a really fun way and actually gives you design recommendations too. So um, if anything, try that out tonight because it's really fun to see what plants grow in your specific area. Yes, yeah, so it'll not only give you um, the information of lists of types of plants that grow in your area, but it'll also have pictures of those plants. So you can really get a lot of information, uh, not only pictures of the plants, but also the size and the what color flower they have and the other attributes about what insects they might support. Right. Thank you so much, Kathy. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Kathy. It. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Well, now we're going to turn to our own Jose Esparza. Jose is a member of our staff here at CNPS and he is leading community science projects for us, including our new fire followers effort. So Jose, welcome. Thank you, Liv. Hey, Jose. Um, all right, well, can you tell us in the audience a bit about yourself and what draws you to this really amazing world and paradigm of community science? Um, yeah, sure. So I'll start by introducing myself first real quick. Um, so my name is Jose Esparza. I was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, and raised in a small town near the central coast of California. Um, when I tell people where I'm from, usually they don't know uh, the town, but it's Nipomo, uh, right by San Luis Obispo. But anyways, I uh, raised here pretty much all my life. I graduated from UCLA with a degree in geography and environmental studies. And i um, always been interested in conservation work with a strong um, intersection in science, community outreach, and environmental justice. And then, um, so yeah, let's talk about a little bit of, about community science, uh, what it is, and really why I'm drawn to it. So uh, community science is uh, essentially scientific research monitoring uh, based on scientific modes of inquiry, which are, uh, one, community-driven and community-controlled. Uh, two, characterized by place-based knowledge and social uh, learning, uh, collective act action and empowerment. And uh, three, uh, typically with a normative aim uh, to negotiate, improve, and or uh, transform governance uh, for stewardship and social ecological sustainability. Uh, now, I'm drawn to this uh, because... Growing up, uh, essentially, I did not have these opportunities to connect with science and my community. And now programs like the Fire Followers uh, allows individuals to educate volunteers and increase outreach to people in science, especially those that have historically been excluded uh, from conservation. Thank you so much, Jose. Thanks, Jose. Yeah, it's, it's such important work. And um, we'd love to hear you tell us about the Fire Followers Project and what it entails. Sure. Um, so the California Fire Followers um, looks to record the response of plants in areas that were affected by the 2020 uh, wildfires. Uh, we utilize iNaturalist and our iNaturalist project, which is uh, essentially an umbrella project with multiple other uh, smaller projects, has fire boundaries from um, the 2020 fires all over California. And our project mainly seeks uh, two things. Um, so one is to change the language around uh, wildfires. We mainly focus on the ecological impacts of wildfires while also not undermining the social impact. Uh, being that fires are multifaceted and um, complex, it is important to note that while they can be traumatic for humans, um, it can actually be a great thing for plants. And um, this will help us develop an understanding of the relationship between fires and plants. And then uh, two is to educate volunteers and increase outreach uh, to people in science. 
And yeah, with the help of people, we can essentially compare uh, plants seen before and after fires and increase an in understanding of uh, fire followers and provide crucial information on species of concern uh, to aid in recovery and conservation efforts in the future. I just think that's so amazing. It's such a cool project. Um, can you tell people what are the really multifaceted ways that they can be involved in the Fire Followers campaign? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are plenty of ways to get involved. Um, so number one, uh, to go out and make observations, right? Uh, that's, I think, is the uh, most fun way to sort of participate. And our program, like I said before, utilizes iNaturalist. And any observation taken within the fire boundaries um, that we have will automatically be um, included in our project. Um, so it's as easy as uh, going online to make an account, uh, joining the project and start making observations via iNaturalist. Um, so if you visit our site, uh, you can actually find local, like local burn sites um, that are open and accessible near you. So you can venture out, take pictures of plants um, within our burn sites. Uh, now, number two, um, another way to get involved is to help with identifications. Uh, now, I myself am aware that outdoor spaces are not as accessible uh, to everyone due to certain barriers. So um, even if you do not live near burn sites or are unable to access uh, certain places, you can also visit uh, our iNaturalist project and help uh, identify plants. And just be sure to comment and uh, make identifications to help um, aid others on their observations. And uh, three is to help us spread the word. So if you know of any programs, uh, organizations, or individuals that would like to uh, partner with us to help spread the word about the project, uh, feel free to contact me. And all the instructions on how to join um, and participate are on our website as well at uh, cnps.org slash fire dash followers. Yes. And then, yeah, uh, lastly, just to emphasize as a way to sort of give back to the community, uh, we also hold multiple challenges a month. So be sure to check out our event calendars, which are posted on our website and then also on our journal entries in the iNaturalist project um, to learn about ways to participate um, and have a chance to win some amazing uh, fire followers. Merch. Yeah, you might just get the coveted fire followers t-shirt, which is... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying limited edition, hard to get. <laughs> so join the fire followers campaign. Yeah. All right. So so now for the really fun part, um, have there been any cool observation highlights, some cool plants or anything else that's been unusual discovery as part of this so far? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this question. Um, so just last week, we, well, early last week, I believe we just hit around our 20th thousand observation. Uh, which is huge because mid-March we were around 10,000 and in terms of finding so far uh, we have quite a list of rare plants uh, that are being found and looking at our iNaturalist observations people are finding plants that we haven't seen in a while and that are appear appearing in burn sites and um, yeah there's really good response from rare bulbs and um, you have things appearing like whispering bells that are appearing in numbers as well as notable species like uh, California puppies and lupins. And just earlier today, uh, I received an email from one of our coworkers, Amy, who found the uh, Mount Hamilton uh, um in one of the burn sites, which is really exciting because this is a rare endemic um, aster that's only found in the Hamilton range and only with like two or three recent uh, sightings. So overall, there are quite a few amazing finds so far. And I encourage everybody, if you have the chance to go to our iNaturalist projects and take a look at the pictures. They're really great, it, um, amazing to uh, look at. And yeah, in terms of storytelling, um, there are a lot of us who were personally moved by uh, people and their stories, specifically with our first journal post on iNaturalist where um, some people, uh, got a chance to sort of share their story and provide a chance to participate and be heard. Um, a lot of people sharing their stories of how, uh, where they were when the fires first started and how they were the first people to uh, call in the fires around that time. So it's really provides us 
special place for um, others to sort of uh, go in and um, tell their side of the story. Wow. That's so cool. It's really um, a very shared experience for so many of us as Californians. So I, I think I think it it registers pretty deeply for people. Yeah. I agree. Thanks. Thanks, Jose. Um, and I, I should point out that our that our fire followers uh, webpage, and again that's cnps.org uh, slash fire dash followers. You can also reach it through the, the cnps.org homepage. Um, that section of our website has some really important kind of need to know information about navigating burn areas and uh, what burn areas that uh, are open. And on that site, we, we kind of mandate that you check the status of these places, uh, whether they're a state park uh, or a natural area to ensure that they're open. But I wanna ask you, Jose, you know, what should folks know? Uh, what are some like really key pieces that they should know as they navigate burn areas um, and how can they use some of these resources I just pointed out to uh, prepare for their adventure? Yeah, no, um, I'm glad you brought that up. I think our website does a tremendous job of highlighting um, the really important part of uh, what you really need to know before you go, right? And it's important uh, to note that a lot of these burn sites can be hazardous. So it's really is good to know before you go and uh, do a little bit of research beforehand. Uh, we have uh, some links to different places on our webpage that are, are that have um, a lot of information on places that are uh, open and accessible. Um, so that's uh, a great uh, resource to use. And uh, really, you want to visit open sites that are uh, both safe from a human perspective um, and also from an ecological perspective as well, because these are vulnerable areas that are recovering a lot of the time. So it's good to keep that in mind. And um, yeah, so I encourage everybody to check it out. And uh, if needed, I can, um, if you need any help with anything, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll do my best to try to help. Beautiful. Thank you, Jose. Thanks so much, Jose. All right. Well, before we wrap things up and kind of like part with some uh, final words and inspiration, um, I'd love to maybe give uh, the audience about five to eight minutes to ask some questions of our panelists. It looks like everyone's still on and happy to uh, facilitate some Q and A. Elizabeth, would you? Uh, I should introduce Elizabeth QB. I call Elizabeth our stage manager because she just takes care of all the behind the scenes operations. She is. She is our producer. Um, so, <laughs> hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> Hello. We did have um, two people wrote in asking about smaller space for gardens and some considerations about that. Um, David, maybe you could speak to the Saturday 360 virtual tours, which will showcase some. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So about small, small spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in fact, on Saturday, we'll be featuring uh, urban gardens and we have a renter in uh, downtown Los Angeles, as well as a renter in uh, downtown San Francisco. And both of these gardens are very small. Um, and they take advantage of the space in really interesting ways, uh, whether that's container plantings. And I really recommend Robert Hall's garden for that. He is an amazing container gardener. Um, but he also thinks about verticality in his space. So there's plants like um, giant uh, parsley uh, or parsnip, excuse me, um, and barberry that grow vertically. So anyway, yes, to Elizabeth's point, check out these 360 tours um, because you can actually jump into the space and see plants in context. And so I recommend looking at uh, the, the, the uh, tours this Saturday for some inspiration. And maybe Kathy can speak to this a little bit, um, dealing with invasive plants. Someone wrote in, they live in a canyon and the property extends to the bottom of San Diego and it's totally covered in invasive plants, mostly grasses and jade. And so do you have any advice for attacking big projects like that and some resources you can recommend? So what we've done, we haven't uh, dealt with jade uh, where I live. Um, it's and when I was gardening around jade, it seemed to be a very shallow rooted plant. Uh, it seems like it would be not difficult to remove, but about the native uh, invasive grasses, uh, what we have done and to this point has been very successful, I feel, is that uh, if the 
plant is uh, quite tall, say maybe over six inches tall, um, uh, we mow it down with uh, a string mower. And uh, that's been very successful on a flatter terrain. On a slope, you may have a different, uh, uh, use a different technique, but when possible, you mow it down with a string mower. And then uh, when we're planting the gardens, uh, we use a sheet mulching with cardboard and then wood chips uh, for areas that you're not, uh, is not amenable to um, uh, sheet mulching. Uh, if, you, if you mow it down and reduce the amount of weed seed, you're going to be increasing your uh, poten uh, the availability of the soil and the sunlight for native plants that you install. Great, thanks, Kathy. Anna, if you're still on, um, do you have any recommendations for trying to learn about uh, traditional ecological knowledge and ethnobotany? I know you uh, said that was kind of something that really got you interested in native plants. Yeah, so I really think that Kat Anderson's book, why am I blinking on it? Tending the wild. <laughs> Tending the wild, thank <laughs> you. And yeah. Braiding Sweetgrass are really beautifully written books. But I also encourage people to actually reach out to local tribe members and learn directly from indigenous mm -hmm. peoples. Because I feel as though in a lot of literature, people talk about native people in past tense. And it's really important to acknowledge that they're still here and practicing their way. So wherever you are, you can always try and look at local museums or even contact your local CNPS chapter and get in contact with some tribe members and learn directly from the source. That's great, Anna. I'd, I'd also yeah. recommend News from Native California is a really great publication mm -hmm. where native authors can explore issues that are important to them or to their tribe or to their community. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also just you know posit that um, ethnobotanical information is uh, you know important and um, vital to an indigenous educator or person or culture keeper, and they don't need to share it. <laughs> it's not <laughs> their obligation to share it with someone. And so just like all things, I think it's about building a relationship as Hannah pointed to, you know, building a relationship uh, with someone in your community or uh, joining one of these forums, subscribing to News from Native California. Those are great ways to start uh, reaching out to um, people in your community who uh, identify as indigenous or are part of the larger California indigenous community. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Hannah. Jose, um, Jamie wrote in, as someone who's trying to dip their toes into the community science realm, do you have any words of wisdom for connecting with communities and inspiring, motivating them to engage with the natural world around them? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I personally love to um, talk to um, especially younger folks to get them inspired to sort of inspired and motivated to sort of engage uh, in science. Um, I always say that the great thing about uh, community science as a whole is that you don't have to be a scientist and really into academia to sort of become involved and um, just reassuring people that um, this is a great way to sort of connect with your community and also um, connect with uh, people and science. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that really answered the, your question, but um, yeah, that's some advice I have. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, Jose. All right. Well, maybe one more, or if, if there's no more, we can, we can tie up. It looks like that's pretty much it. If anyone has one final question, you can write it in now and maybe answer. <laughs> so we were very fortunate um, in Porterville and connecting with many uh, local groups because what the project entailed was to get, in, to get local groups to adopt gardens. That meant reaching out to local groups. So through the school system was one of the ways that I reached out to uh, groups. Also, um, 
the churches are quite a good way of reaching communities of people who are um, who want to make a positive difference in the world. So church groups, uh, civic groups such as the Lions Club and things like um, other environmental groups, those are all good ways to do it. Also getting a Facebook page or other social media page uh, where uh, people who know you can help share the word uh, is another very good way to get in touch with the community and, and to increase the interest in the area that you're working on. Great, thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, all right, well, I want to wrap it up. Thank you again for joining us. And thank you all of you fabulous panelists for sharing the diverse ways that you grow care. We really appreciate you being on here tonight. Um, and so I want to just say, you know, California Native Plant Week is ongoing. And there's so many ways that you can grow care this week and beyond. So uh, jump onto this URL here, our uh, California Native Plant Week um, page, which is also you can go straight to our homepage to get to. We'll be launching 360 tours um, each day until Saturday. I also wanna throw out that uh, CNPS chapters, nurseries and botanic gardens have a full slate of awesome promotions. Um, California Botanic Garden has a wildflower passport activity you can take advantage of. Tree of Life has a 10% discount on plants at their nursery um, down, in, down in the San Diego area uh, through Native Plant Week and there's tens upon tens more promotions. So check out that website for all of those um, available offerings. Um, and I wanna turn it to leave to um, connect us to some other ways that we can grow care um, this native plant we can be on. Sure, I mean, there's so many ways. I would encourage everyone, you know, website cnps.org, you can see some of our current campaigns and priorities going on. Um, you know, we're really trying to support um, assembly member reward and um, seeing this legislation through um, the whole legislative season. So, you know, he could definitely use words of support and gratitude for the work he's done. And please do call your representatives um, in California and ask them to support Assembly Bill 223 um, to make a real difference for native plants on the legislative front this, this year. Um, you know, there, there's so many ways, another important and, and um, natural resource area you could get involved in the state of California right now is that um, California Natural Resource Agency is hosting a series of regional workshops to get input on um, California's plans to conserve 30% of our land and waters by 2030. Um, you can learn more by going to their website. Um, on the fun side, if there are any artists still watching um, that were inspired by um, and Gabriel's work. We have our Forever Forest, Forest Art Contest happening, and we very much would love for you to submit anything that feels inspiring to you about our forest. We have a number of categories um, to um, enter, and those categories align with some of the ecological principles that um, are characteristic of, of healthy and resilient forests. Um, and then of course, please get involved in the fire followers effort. And um, as Jose said, there's lots of ways to get involved even if you can't get out there in the field. Um, your, your input and, and interest is needed even in IMAT. So um, thanks so much for, for caring, for showing up today. Um, and I really, oh, oh, Hannah wants a t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna have. <laughs> so thank you guys. Thank you to our wonderful, wonderful guests and panelists today. You inspire us with the work you're doing. All right. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a great California Native Plant Week. <laughs> Good night.